All right, so we talked about um, Romans 8, 14 to 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. This is so important. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's a, that's a key part, too, we won't talk about today. But, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So in the previous weeks, we talked about this. We talked about how um, without the knowledge of being sons, we can have this distant, cold relationship with God where we're kind of shooting a prayer out to God up in heaven, the big man upstairs, and hope that he kind of sends a little blessing back down to us. If he's got any to spare, that'd be good. Very distant, kind of like a uh, uh, a person that you, you may know, you may want to know, you want to kind of know them a little better, hopefully. Maybe if you go to church, you'll get to know them a little better. Those kind of things. But really, that's not where we've been put. We've been put in the family as sons, not as, you know, partial sons, maybe as weekend-only kind of sons, but actually sons of God. And we talked about the three different types that are taught a lot of times, God the people manager, God the great motivator, and God the super fixer. Do you remember those three? So those are three ideas that are taught in churches that that's what God is, that he's those, the things that God does is who God is. You see what I'm saying? And God is not the things that he does. He is. And isn't that what he told Moses? I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the things that I do. I am. It's the presence of God himself, not the things that God does. But most people have a relationship with the things that God does, and that's how they understand him is the things that he does. So if I understand what a person does without actually knowing them, that's not the kind of relationship that we have with him. We have a very close one. That's the reason why sometimes it's so surprising to us when he talks to us so specifically and directly. Because we're like, whoa, did you know me like that? And they're like, yeah, he does. He knows you really well because he's in us. So we learned about this, and we learned that the theme of some of the teaching that goes on about God being the people manager, you know, because big churches need lots of people management. It does. I mean, you need management. You need administrators, which is called the gifts of administration. And the gifts of, of administration is probably right now in larger churches the most highly valued gift in the church. But it's not a five-fold gift. It's not. It's a helps gift. And, but it is the most valued one in large organizations because the churches are run like businesses. And so because of that, and of course I'm not saying that having administrations is bad because it's in the Bible. And I'm also not saying big churches are bad because the church is big. And I'm not saying any of these other things that you may think I'm saying, not saying those things. I'm just saying that God wants us to know him primarily as daddy. And if we can just approach him in that way, we will have such a wonderful time in the spirit with him, just enjoying his presence. So just remember all these things. Know what I am saying and what I'm not saying. Okay, so last week we kept going and we went into Hebrews 12. And this time we had some fun because we got into the Aramaic. You can start at Hebrews 12, 1. And um, we're looking at the Aramaic because there's some translation issues in the Greek that the Aramaic clears up. And so we just decided to do that. And also we've been wondering about Aramaic. So Aramaic is Hebrew, right? And so there is a translation um, that is a verified translation. It's the Hebrew version of the New Testament. And so it's in there. You can look it up. I'm not going to go into it too much today other than just to tell you that's a translation we're talking about. So we read Hebrews 12. We went through verses 1. We talked about the cloud of witnesses that's surrounding us. You know, it's, a, it's witnesses that are surrounding us like a cloud. Talked about how we're never alone. We talked about looking to Jesus, who completes our faith. He starts it, and he completes it. So earlier when I was talking about how being consistent is so important, one of the reasons is Yeshua, Jesus, because Yeshua is the one that starts it, and Yeshua is the one that ends it, completes it for us. So that whole thing is, you know, starting and ending it completes is a circle, okay? So we start back at the beginning again, and we just keep looping this thing, and we keep growing up into him. Okay, so that's, that's some of the things what it looks like. So then it talks about um, that they forgot the encouragement um, of what it was because discipline is encouraging. So we talked about discipline, and we also talked about how discipline is also misinterpreted in a lot of, a lot of teaching because discipline is almost like being disciplined by your CEO. 
you have a work penalty. You have been penalized, bad. You know, you are not getting the company vision down, and because of that, you're being disciplined. And that's not what this is, because number one, we're sons. And the father is disciplining us as sons, not as the CEO in the sky. And so this is another ver version of God that's taught in churches, and it's distant CEO God. And usually the distant CEO God is taught when we're talking about submission to authority. Now, do we submit to authority? Yes, because that's, you know, we're not rebellious, of course. God puts authorities in place, but God is an authority, but he's primarily father. And so when you approach him as father, and then you see that he disciplines us for what? For us, and so what's a discipline do? It causes you to repent. And what is repentance? It's a changing of your perspective. So if God wanted to, he could just leave you on the same path going down this way of complete falsity, of, of understanding him in the wrong way, but he doesn't. He disciplines us for something. For what? He disciplines us so that we would repent, we would change our perspective and see it the right way because have we ever had the wrong ideas about stuff when it comes to God? Of course. Like all of the stuff that we knew was wrong and we had to learn all of it from the beginning, but now we're continuing to learn it, okay? So we talked about that last week. We talked about strangers and sons and then we ended... We didn't end with this, but we talked about spiritual fathers and how spiritual fathers discipline us, okay? And so the spiritual fathers are what? The witnesses. <laughs> We're reading the book of Hebrews. Hello? Who wrote that? The Apostle Paul. These are spiritual fathers. And so they have an interest. This is the thing I want us to emphasize. The, the, the witnesses that are around us like a cloud have a very strong interest in you. Very strong. They are very, very much, not like worried, but they are very much excited about and active in the development of us into mature sons. And because of that, we will get messages from continually from the witnesses. They witness to the things that they have learned and seen and grown in in the spirit, and they witness that to us. Why? So that we can grow into fully developed sons because it's us and them together that are growing together into the fullness of the body of Christ. This is exactly the plan. So there is not a separation between us and the church in heaven. There is a continual interaction between us and them, and we're growing and learning and developing in the spirit because they have a lot more experience than we do. They have a lot more experience than the oldest ministers we have that are in a body on the earth right now. They have thousands of years of experience. And so we learn these things and we grow through this discipline of the Spirit. And we talked about some other things as well. So now verse 18. Let's, let's start up today in verse 18. So for you have not... So, so what it said at the, at the verse, end of verse 17 is it was talking about how with Esau, you know, he sold his birthright, okay, for, for just a meal. That's verse 16. He sold it, right? Be careful, or else any be found among you destitute of the grace of Elohim, or else some root of bitterness shoot forth germs and trouble you, and thereby many to be defiled. And we talked about bitterness last week. We talked about how it spreads. And, and then it says, or else anyone be found among you a fornicator or a reckless one like Esau, who for one mess of food sold his birthright. So it's just one little thing of food. He, saw, he, saw, he got rid of it. And then what happened is, is he came back and he cried, verse 17, and he said, I really want this back. I really screwed up. And he, and he couldn't. He wished it, but he couldn't because he was, he was foolish and reckless with what he did. Okay? So we don't lose our sonship. Okay? So it's not talking about that. What it's saying here is that in the discipline of the Lord, as we're developing as sons of God, it's important that we aren't reckless with that stuff. We aren't reckless with the things that we've learned and that we're growing in. Because remember, we're sons. Now, we could mess up those things, but what does it do? It, it, it delays us a little bit, right? It might delay some things that were going to happen. They don't happen because we, we backtracked a little and we did some things that were reckless. Because, you know, Esau, he's in the cloud of witnesses. He didn't lose everything, right? Because he's brought in by Christ. So there's a restoration of all things that takes place, so that's not a problem. But see, what God wants us to do is to really enjoy him all the time and never have a time where we weren't enjoying him. You see what I'm saying? He didn't ever want us to have that period where we weren't enjoying the Lord. We should never have that period. That's why he's saying, always 
Don't be reckless, but always stay in the spirit. Always stay charged. Always stay powered up. Always stay in a place of discipline and continual repentance, the spiraling down of changing your perspective to begin to see things clearer and clearer of what they really are and not the way we've been taught they were from an earthly perspective, but from a heavenly perspective. Okay, so now he goes into verse 18. For you have not come to the fire that burned and the tangible mount, nor to the darkness and obscurity and raging storm, nor to the sound of the shofar and the voice of words which they who heard entreated that it might no more be spoken to them. For they could not endure what was commanded, and even a beast, if it approached the mountain, was to be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I fear and tremble. This is Mount Sinai. And it's saying here that you haven't come to this mountain, Mount Sinai. This is where the children of Israel came under the old covenant, the original covenant. This is where they came, and this is how they saw God. Because this is what it was looking like. It was fire. It was a mountain. It was things trembling. It was a voice coming and commanding certain things that even because of this, what? In a, in a state where the spirit was separated. And God knew this, right? There couldn't be that closeness that he wanted. But he presented himself there because it's a starting spot. It's showing us the difference from without and within. So from without, it's a fiery, trembling, fearful thing, far away, you know, not, not close at all. This is the CEO God. This is the God who's the people planner. This is the God who is the super fixer that you can shoot a, a prayer off to every once in a while, and maybe you do some works to kind of make it seem a little more tangible to you, you know. This is, this is that kind of God where you're trembling and you're terrified to even come close because of the words that are spoken, they're commanded, and they're, you know, scary. He's scary, you know. The, it's like you have a little puppy. He comes near the mountain. You have to kill it. What? You know, I mean, it's like terrible. I mean, that could be a little frightening, wouldn't it? So, so this is not the mountain we have come to. It is a mountain that Israel came to, right? So God was terrifying this is not someone you're getting very close to. And so he, they said, well, just have, let's, let's just have Moses go up. Well, how about we do, let's do that. I'm going to be over here hiding in the corner. Moses will go and he can just tell us what God says. They're thinking, send Moses in. You know, if he doesn't make it out, we'll just send another person until we finally get out. I mean, it's like that kind of thing. I mean, it's scary. You know, sometimes when people go to church, it's scary. People are scared to go to church. Has anybody ever been scared? Listen, I've been in church my whole life, and even when I was little, sometimes I was scared to go to some churches because I was like, that's a scary church. Just because you didn't know what they were going to do. A lady could be grabbing you by the ear and putting you in the thing, and, you know, we don't talk like that here, da, 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 you know, all these rules, and you're like almost scared, right? Mount Sinai, brother, they've got it. Listen, why would he put this in here, you have not come to Mount Sinai? Because there's people that can treat God this way still. You could go to a scary church where they have a lot of rules, where if you break the rules, you're stoned in the spirit. You're cast out, right? <laughs> Stone that person. You are no longer a part of this assembly. We have dismissed you, you know? And it's like this place that they, and so what people do is they come to these places, these buildings that we set up or these organizations that we set up, and we say, this organization represents the most high God, right? Isn't that what churches do? Isn't that how we perceive it? So, so we go to a church, it represents God, though God is a spirit, right? And you can't see him, yet he's everywhere. And you can go out in the middle of the field and worship God just as good as if you were in a building, right? Yet here we have these organizations. Does anybody find any of this weird? I think it's weird. And the more you think about it, the weirder it gets. And the fact that I'm actually in a building right now and we have a church is even weirder because I'm talking about the fact that that's not actually even how it works. But that is what we're used to. So this is the paradigm we're going to use to get this message across, okay? So, <laughs> whoo, we're all over the place. Okay, so, uh, so God was terrifying. Even Moses, who spoke to God face to face and was God's friend, said, I am terrified. Even he said that. That's pretty significant. That means Mount Sinai was a scary situation, okay? But God is a God of love. So what's the scariness have to do with? Well, the scariness has to do with what it looks like outside. 
This is the outsiders. This is when you're not. Now, it doesn't mean God wanted them outside. That was not what he wanted. But there had to be an establishment of the law. And why is that? Because there had to be this tutor. There had to be some type of protection, some type of covering over the children of Israel until the answer came, which was Jesus, in time. So it's a time-based thing. It's like a click, 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 click. So this is the thing that was in that time spot was the law to bring in. So the law is real, and it's good, and it's written on our heart. But that was the whole point, was to put it in the heart, not a law of commandments written on stone tablets. The tablet that was written on is the tablet of our hearts. That was always the intention. So we don't need to be approaching God from Sinai. That's not where we've come. We haven't come to that. We needed a mediator, not just Moses. And we needed to be what? Born into his family. Okay, so we've been born into a new kingdom, into a family. Now, look what it says in verse 22. But you have come to Mount, and this is Zion. I guess that's what it looks like. Mount Zion, into the city of the living Elohim, which is God, the Jerusalem, Jerusalem that is in heaven, and to the assemblies of myriads of messengers myriads, assemblies too. That means there's groups of them that get together. The, the messengers are the angels, okay? And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. The firstborn, that's us, okay? And to Elohim, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the just who are perfected, and to Yeshua, the mediator of the renewed covenant, and to the sprinkling of his blood, which speaks better than that of Abel. So we have not come to Mount Sinai, at Mount Sinai. We've come to Mount Zion. The city, this is Jerusalem in heaven, you know? And, and if you've done a study on this, you realize that, that, that there's a Jerusalem beneath and a Jerusalem above. Both of them are important. That's why what we're seeing right now in the Middle East, where we're moving our embassy to Jerusalem, and now everybody else is moving their embassy to Jerusalem, that carries a very high spiritual significance. Why is that? Because we actually go in and out of the heavenly Jerusalem. This is a real place. This, is, this really exists. The fact that the world is beginning to recognize Jerusalem as the center, not the center of Israel, mind you. Jerusalem is the center of the earth. <laughs> it's the capital <laughs> of the earth. Because the capital is the match of its heavenly place, Mount Zion, the spiritual Jerusalem. This is where we go. It's not the spiritual Jerusalem replaced the natural Jerusalem. They're still connected. Remember, there is no difference. It's not natural stuff and spiritual stuff. It's whoosh, together. So we're beginning to see some things happen in the earth that are representative. Who's going into heaven? We are. What's happening now in Jerusalem? It's being established as the capital because Jerusalem is being established as the capital in our own hearts. And that's why we go there. That's why we live from there. That's why we rule from there. You see? So there's a connection between these two. It's Jerusalem beneath, Jerusalem above. On earth as it is in heaven. So when the saints of God begin to move up and down, as we begin to realize that we are the gates and the doors into heaven, as we begin to move into the spiritual realm, we're getting messages from the messengers, right? We're getting trained and tutored up by the spiritual fathers. We're learning things about how things work in heaven. And what's happening on the earth? It's happening on the earth as it is in heaven. The church is beginning to realize that their actual house is not the buildings that they made or the relationships that they made with each other. Those, those are all good, but their actual house is the spiritual Jerusalem. It is the place that we go to and that you have gone to and that you are in. And we can move up and down, okay? So it's a wild party, and it's in heaven, and there's a lot of people up there, and we're going to see a lot of stuff, and it's going to be really cool, and we're starting to see it now. So where's all the people? Everywhere. <laughs> The, the church is everywhere. The, 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 the witnesses are all around us. The angels are all around us. The party is already happening. Listen, it's great when we get together in a big group, you know, like we had last week at the Germain Arena, and they had a big worship service, which I think is totally awesome, though I did not go to it. But there's way more than that. 
There's way more than that. You know, it's great to see denomination, denominational walls break down, people beginning to see each other as the same church. That's all good. And that all has to do with something. It has to do with God bringing us to this place of maturity where we're recognizing where our actual home is. It's the New Jerusalem. And it's coming down from heaven. This is, there is some stuff that's going to happen that's going to be really cool. But we're beginning to interact in the spirit now with these with these. This, these groups of people, and they have been waiting a long time <laughs> for us to begin to do this again, and they're very excited about it. They're very excited. So just let the Lord lead you into each step. And like I said, the revelation that you get from God starts from the revelation that you have right now. It's not something new. This is something you're already walking in, but continue in it and keep taking the path that he's given to you because you will see that further revelation as you continue in the light that you've been given. The light that I've received, I've got from the places that I've been where God's given me light. I, you can look back at my doctrine, see the things that I've learned and where I've come from, and I keep going down that path, and God keeps revealing more and more to me, and I realize I have no idea about anything <laughs> that I thought I did, you know, and that's the way God brings us, and it's so good, okay? So verse 25, beware, therefore, or else you refuse to hear him who speaks with you. So there's a warning. There's still a warning here, right? For if they did not escape who refused to hear him who spoke with them on the earth, how much more will we not if we refuse to hear him who speaks with us from heaven? Is it possible to completely ignore the voice of God who's like, and the horns are going off and the messengers are running around, things are happening, and, and is it possible to just be like, nope, it's just this. Nope, maybe when we're dead. You know? Can you do that? Sure you could. You could refuse the voice. You could refuse the calling of God. You could refuse the, the, um, the discipline. Couldn't, couldn't you refuse a discipline? I mean, it's a hard way when you refuse discipline. Can I get a witness? Any, any kids? <laughs> when you refuse discipline, it is not fun, right? It's much easier to just give yourself over to discipline because the discipline will change you to make these things a lot easier later on. So if our perspective is wrong about the spiritual realm and we're being disciplined to change how we're thinking about heaven, how we're thinking about our place in the family, if we resist that and we decide, well, I really like the old systems, because what do systems do? Churches make systems to replace intimacy. I'd rather have a system than have intimacy with my father. You see, that's not good. But God's correcting us in this. He's disciplining us in this. And he's telling us, you don't need a system. You need intimacy. You need intimacy with me so that we can just enjoy this together because there's, there's a higher way. And this stuff that we're making is not the way. It's the stuff that he already made. It's the paths, right? The paths of the righteous. <laughs> the paths of the righteous is not a bunch of law and works. The paths of the righteous are in the spirit. That's a whole other lesson right there. I won't even, I should write that down. I should teach on that one day. Okay, so being in this place, Mount Zion, we can refuse to hear him who speaks even though we are sons. And just because you refuse to listen does not mean there are no repercussions. There are repercussions if we don't want to listen. Have you ever had a time where you didn't listen or have seen somebody who didn't listen? There's a repercussion. But God is so gracious. He doesn't leave us in those places. He continues to bring us into more truth, even if we did refuse for a time, okay? It's not an excuse to refuse. Hey, you can decide to be miserable if you want. God lets you do that. But why? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like people come up to you. Now, listen, can you tell me if this, this, and this are a sin, and this, this, and this are a sin? It's like, well, how miserable do you want to be? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, you want to be completely miserable and just get into things that you're thinking are sin and, and you're not sure they are, but you know you're miserable? I mean, why not just go full into God and just enjoy the life of God and enjoy the joy of the Holy Spirit? Why bother with being miserable any second? <laughs> right? Okay. So, and a lot, of, a lot of doctrinal debate is about that. What's a sin and what's not a sin? Why is that? Because there's no intimacy with the Father. Everything's a system. They want to know what new system they need to make for what law they have to keep for what law they're not breaking for this and that and the other thing. Oh, well, you believe in grace. That means you believe in no law, which means everybody's just crazy. And it's like, no, you're, you're dealing with a works-based, system-based theology that has no intimacy with the Father, and you're not even getting your information from heaven. You're just making systems based on what you heard heaven was like. And that's a problem. And that's why a lot of churches are bound up in theological debates. They're not growing any, and all people want to do is argue about the Bible because nobody's spending any time with the Lord. Because the Bible is the Lord to them. 
their law. They put their faith only in the law. They don't put it in him. And that's called being under the law. We're not under the law. <laughs> right? Okay. Verse 27. Oh, not verse 27. Verse 25, a little in here. So we can refuse to hear him who speaks, whose voice, right? So if, if we had an issue <laughs> under Mount Sinai, because they didn't want to hear the voice of God, their hearts weren't right. They didn't have the law on their hearts, right? So they didn't want to hear him. So he's like, if there was a problem back then, what do you think happens if we refuse now? Well, there's still going to be a problem, right? So what does it say? Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised and said yet again once more, I will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. So there is coming, and this is for sure. I've seen it. <laughs> I've had visions of it. And there is a shaking coming to the earth that is unstoppable. And it is, it is, it is terrifying. It is absolutely terrifying. And you will realize that it is affecting everything and everyone on the entire planet. And no one, and I mean no one, will be able to stand. Not a single person will be able to stand in the shaking. And it's coming. And it shook once the earth. And now it's going to shake both the earth and the heavens. Okay? So it's going to affect spiritual beings as well as natural ones. Isn't that what that means? you got heaven and earth. So there are things in the heavens, and they've been doing their thing the whole time, having their own little party of destruction, and all of a sudden here comes God is coming back, and he's going to shake it. He's shaking everything. I believe that the shaking has already started. Does anybody feel like that? I feel like the shaking has already started because the things that we've had in our lives that we've built that are not of him are being shaken to the ground, and there's nothing left of them. And you're standing there, you go, well, what happened? Be like, now look up. And now let the Spirit, so what happens is we get shaken, and then the Spirit comes up and lifts us up into the eternal realm, into the Spirit now. Now we begin to move in the Spirit. Now we begin to see things from a spiritual perspective instead of from a natural place, right? It's good. It's good. Okay, so His Word shakes us, it sh right? Because it's His Word. His Word shakes us. His Word goes forth and it shakes us. It shakes earthly things, earthly beings, heavenly beings as well. And this is the coming time. So being in this place in Mount Zion, we can refuse to hear him speak even though we're sons, right? So these are the things that are going to happen. So the things that we erect in our lives that are in rebellion to him, rebellion into the plan. So you have a plan, you have a thing. You know what it is. It's written in your scroll. And you rebel against it and decide to do something different. That gets shaken. Has anybody had anything like that shaken out of their lives? First of all, the fact that you didn't know Jesus, that was in rebellion, right? So that's shaken out of your life already. Because now you're like, oh, it's Jesus. Well, that was wrong. I'm going to get rid of all this nonsense that I, Tower of Babel business that I did in my own life. And now we're going to go to Mount Zion. So you've already had this happen, but there's more. There's more. And it's fun. Because repentance is good and it's fun. And it's great. It's like, wow, I didn't even know that before. Now I know that. I'm so happy about that. Right? So we can be excited to repent. Repentance is fun. It's exciting. It's fun. It's good because you're not stubborn, right? There's no stubborn, obstinate type of people that are just like, I, I dare you to shake me. I dare. Oh, yeah, that's going to go well. <laughs> that's going to go really good, I can tell. All right, verse 27. And these words once more indicates the transformation of the things that are shaken, okay? Because they are fabricated. That the things which will not be shaken may remain. So it's fabricated. Our church systems are fabricated. I can go down a list of them. I won't this morning for <laughs> your guys' sake, but I can go down a list of, of systems. Shaken, 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 shaken. And when they're all done, everyone's going to go, what happened to the church? It's completely fallen apart. And you're going to be like, no, it hasn't. All the systems have shaken. And now we get to stand up, right? Because this is what's happened. It's just sleep, sleepy, sleepy time church, right? We're so sleepy, and we got our music, and we got our systems, and we got our things, and it makes us feel comfortable. And, and God's like, that's what I think of your tea party. And you're like, what? What did you do? He's like, hey, man, come on. Stop messing around. Let's do some fun stuff together, right? And so he shakes this stuff out. And so this is a transformation of things. Traditions are getting shaken out right now. Traditions right now, today, are getting shaken all over the earth, there's traditions that we've held on to that are not biblical, that are not from heaven, that are not from God. And God is shaking them out right now. Men's doctrines instead of heaven is being shaken. Now, organizations that have a form of godliness but deny the power are being shaken now. 
And there's many of these. And they're intellectual and they're humanistic in their source. And they have a series of laws and legal things that, that, that we think is helping us. But in reality, it's lost its connection to the head, which is Jesus. And because of that, they're getting shaken. So they're going to be nice. They're going to look nice. And we're going to go, how did that happen? That was a nice organization. Well, the reason is, is because these are systems that do not have their pattern in the heavenly realm. The pattern is earthly. And because of that, they're going to shake. And they're going to fall over. But a lot of them, some of them are good people too. So they'll just stand right back up, but they'll be in the spirit now. That's all. You just be in the spirit. Let's just click, click gears out of this into that. It's simple. Right? Out of this into that. So these are going to happen. It's not just the earth. It's the heavens. The word's going forth. Now, Romans 8, 18. Wow, I'm really late today. You guys can stay with me though, right? Okay, I started a little late. Romans 8, 18. And this was a shorter message. It's so funny. I have absolutely no idea. <clears throat> so we, we looked at Romans, but I'm going to look at Romans 8.18 in the Aramaic, which I did not put on the slides. So you're going to have to just listen, and I will try to read it very slow. Okay. <laughs> I know. I could, I, could, I, could, I, could, I could text it to you. Okay, Romans 8.18. and Because uh, we were reading in Romans 8 at the beginning here, uh, Romans 8.14 to 17, and now we're going to continue okay, along that in verse 18. So, so look what it says here, that what happens when things shake? The landscape changes, doesn't it? Yes. You know, if you have a shaking, things that were up are now down. Some things that were down are now up, right? Mountains come up from a shaking. Mountains go down from a shaking. So there's some terraforming going on here with the shaking. The landscape's going to change. The things are going to change that we see in the earth and in the heavens in both places. We're used to these mountains of power from these demonic strongholds and things like that. They're gonna, their time's going to be up, and it's going to shake too. Okay. Now, we're seated above that, mind you, so we're not going to be doing anything in that realm. Okay. But, but this, is, this is what's happening. Okay, so verse Romans 8, verse 18. For I consider well that the sufferings of the present are not comparable with the glory which is to be perfected in us. Okay? So we talked about how discipline can be unpleasant, right? Because you just change your perspective on something that you had for a very long time. That's an unpleasant thing. It's not comfortable when you start changing your mind because you're like, oh, you know, and then I have to remember that again. I was like, oh, yeah, it's not like that anymore, you know? So it's uncomfortable at first. Or maybe you have pride. If you have pride, it's very uncomfortable because pride is going to be like, no, and then you're going to be like, oh, put that pride down. You know, so there is this uncomfortableness, and there's these things that happen on the earth, but he's saying it's not even to be comparable with the glory which is to be perfected in us. So we're going through this process now of what? Perfected as sons. And what does perfected mean? It's maturity. It's maturity. It's not like you're perfect under the law. It has to do with being grown up into maturity as sons of God. And maturity of sons of God, yes, it has everything to do with the love of God because it's totally, completely in Him. And it does have to do with the love of God. So as we allow God to reveal to us who we are, it's changing us. His Word is changing us. And what are we becoming? We're becoming like Jesus, exactly like Him. So this is this transformation that's taking place. And we are becoming sons of light. Okay? Sons of light. Mature fully developed sons of light. So like, like with Peter, where he walks by, right? And the shadow of Peter falls on the people and they get healed, just his shadow, because now his spirit is projected out further, even than his own body. You know, so we can do these things. So as we mature as sons, we're beginning. So like even the early disciples, you can see as their maturity, as they become mature in, in, in the things of God. Look at the apostle John, you know? They couldn't even kill the apostle John. They, they tried to, they couldn't, right? So they just send them away. So you see this maturity come as we begin to walk like Jesus. Who else couldn't they kill? Jesus. They tried to kill him many times, but he just walked right through them. Why? Because as mature sons, we begin to walk like Jesus did. We begin to act like Jesus did. Not like super spiritual religious Jesus pretend that the, that the church is made up. He's not real. That's a demon, right? We become like the Jesus that's in the Gospels, not the false one. That's what we, like an antichrist spirit. Right? We're not an antichrist spirit, super religious, telling everybody what to do, super full of rules and regulations and some type of crazy systems that we made. We're full of love. We reach to people. We, get, we demonstrate what? Not our love, but God's love in us towards the world. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he wants you to be well. Yes, he, he, he wants you to have your family straightened out because he doesn't like you either. 
He doesn't like it when things are messed up. He likes it when things are working good because he loves you so much. That's the thing. Yeah, but they got a tattoo. Who cares what they've got? What have you got? What kind of tattoo do you have on in your spirit as a religious person? What is what are you what are you portraying? What's your tattoo portraying? The law? You know what I'm saying? Cruelty to people? What is that in the spirit? You know, and everyone's concerned with things in the natural. What is that natural tattoo? That could be something that God loves. Maybe it has something about God on it. Maybe it has something about the devil on it. You're like, oh my goodness, that's a good reminder of how far I've come. Why not? You know what I'm saying? We look at things in the natural. That's, our, that's the mindset that the Spirit of God is taking. That's something that needs to be shaken out of us if that's something that we're used to, okay? Looking at somebody. Well, where'd we come from? What do you think? What makes, you, what makes us any better than anybody else? Nothing, <laughs> you know? Sometimes people have, have issues with, with financial things, you know? Well, they have more money and they have less money. And we produce these divisions, in our minds, and these things where we're really just one spirit with the Lord, okay? So we need to watch these things. So anyway, we are being prepared to rule, okay? Now, we have authority right now in the name of Jesus. We have authority over it. If, if a spirit is foolish enough, which they tend to be pretty foolish, <laughs> to interfere in the life of a son of God, they will get their butt kicked. Why? Why is that? Because of the name of Jesus. What in the world did you think you were doing? You're leaving right now in Jesus' name. You see what I'm saying? We have authority in that realm. But that's just, this is like training wheels, <laughs> okay? This is, this is like, in the, in, in, in the Old Testament, they left a few of the nations there, the, the, the bad nations, so that their kids had someone to practice on. Because they beat all the big ones. They're like, well, we'll leave a couple here because when we go on, we want our kids to be able to fight too and learn how to fight. So we're going to leave them there and they can fight them later. You know? So we've got, a, we got some stragglers. We've got some stuff. We've got some interference down here. And it's good training wheels because we're being brought into a place of sonship where we rule and reign in a much higher level than we've even realized. Because we're look, dealing with one planet here. It's just one. Well, it's a good thing to get started on, right? Okay. So, verse 19, for the whole creation, okay, Romans 8, 19, in the Aramaic says, for the whole creation is hoping and waiting for the development of the sons of Elohim. The whole creation is hoping and waiting for the development of what? The rapture of Jesus when he's going to come in the clouds? No, for the development of the sons of God. Stop pushing this thing off and start growing up. Amen. Put away these false theologies, these false doctrines regarding end time, apocalyptic, end of the world, Terminator 2 style stuff. We need to stop that. That is an imagination, and it is causing many Christians to be stunted in their growth and not pursue the greater things of God because they're waiting for Jesus to save them again. He's already saved you. It is now time to mature, to become fully developed sons in the things of God and begin to operate as the sons of God instead of as some son that's waiting for something else to happen. It's already happened. Okay? And the creation knows this. So the people that are the last to the party were us. Because the creation was already waiting for us. That's why they're hoping and waiting for what? The development. But we want to make another business. We want to make some more money here. We want, and I'm saying it's fine to make money and everything, but why not just move in the spirit? It's way more fun, you know? And it's good to have money, and money will come to you. That's not, I mean, but it's just earthly stuff. And use your money right. You know what I'm saying? It's not, a, it's not an excuse to be irresponsible, you know, and use your body right. It's not an excuse to be irresponsible with your body. You see what I'm saying? There's a correspondence here between the natural and the spiritual, but really what we're waiting for isn't the rapture. We're waiting for the development of the sons of God. The whole creation's waiting for it. So what are we going to do? The spirit of the Lord is our tutor. The same tutor Jesus got. Isn't that what he said? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And if you read the rest of that scripture, it talks about 
who the Spirit of the Lord is. It's the sevenfold Spirit of the Lord, and you can see the different aspects of the sevenfold Spirit of the Lord, which is the menorah. Same Spirit of the Lord training us. The Spirit of wisdom is very active in the church right now. That's why a lot of people are growing in revelation regarding the things of heaven that they never knew about before. And they're like, oh my goodness, I have to keep changing my doctrine. It's okay. It's the spirit of the Lord. Because the spirit of the Lord is upon us. The glory of the Lord has returned to the church. There was periods of time here where we were just kind of, there was a bit of a judgment because yes, the church did do just that. They did not respond to the voice of God. And so there was a period of time where a lot of this, but it's kicking back in. And there's people right now that are willing to do it. They're willing to put aside things. This is one of the problems that, you know, and Brother Hagan said it, and so did um, Bob Jones. They said the same thing. They said, these guys got too interested in money. They were using their gift to make money for themselves, and God did not like that. So let's not do that. Let's not use the gift of God to make money or even to make, see, now we're on the Internet. Now we have fame. Don't use that for fame. Don't use that. Now we have, like, big churches and things. You know, let's not use it for that. Let's use it for the kingdom of heaven. Let's use the spirit of the Lord for us to be trained in the fivefold ministry to say, hey, look, we're going to be here for a little while, but it's the spirit of the Lord that's going to train you and teach you and bring you into a developed son of God. Okay? Because there is only a certain period of time, and there will not be a fivefold ministry because it only is here until we're fully developed. So right now, fivefold is kicking it into high gear. It's going to be through the roof. And why is that? Not because the fivefold needs to be elevated, because at some point, boop, 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 we disappear, we're all sons, okay? So just get in, get what God's given you right now until that thing just kicks in and you'll see yourself being fully developed as the son of God, okay? So verse 20, for the creation, so the creation is hoping and waiting for the development of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to vanity, not by its own choice, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that also the creation itself would be emancipated from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the sons of Elohim. So what does this mean? It means the creation is in this place of vanity. It's in this vain spot. It's not supposed to be where it is right now. It's, it's there in the hope that the creation itself would be set free from the bondage of corruption. What's the corruption? How did the corruption get here? Well, it's the sin. It's the law of sin and death. It's on the creation. But Jesus set us free from the law of sin and death right? So who's the one that can do something to the creation? The sons of Elohim, the sons of God. So there are things in creation that aren't right, that aren't subjected to God. Things kill each other. That's not cool, <laughs> right? Plants die. Plants shouldn't be dying. There should never be a dead plant. I know that seems weird. I mean, you spray your grass with this stuff. There shouldn't be weeds and things. Things should be fruitful. None of that is right, it's like, how can you say stuff like that? Of course that's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. What are you talking about? This is nonsense. It's a fairy tale. It's not a fairy tale. It's what it's saying. The earth is corrupted. You can look back in Genesis and see that it wasn't always like that. So it's not just our church meetings. It's not just telling people about Jesus. But what are we doing? There is an actual redemption of this planet from its fallen state. There is a redemption that takes place on the entire earth. Nobody tells you that. They tell you that the earth is going to get wiped out. God's going to fold it up like a blanket, throw it into the fire, and end a story. Goodbye. And he's coming back. For what? Judgment. To destroy it. Maybe it's nuclear. Maybe it's whatever. We don't even know. But it's going to be really bad. Right? And that's not what this is saying. It's saying that creation isn't waiting to be destroyed. It's waiting to be redeemed. <laughs> so why are we teaching this false doctrine? And a lot of this goes into this kind of... Um, unknown end time doctrine where nobody really says they know for sure but they do know it's going to be really bad well how do you know it's going to be really bad when the scripture says that it's waiting for it to be really good okay so the potential has always been within us but we were told we had to wait we were told there would be a catching away first then we would come back and then we could be sons isn't that what we were taught you're not sons until you're caught away in the rapture. You go up to meet Jesus in the air, then you're sons. Then you come back super powerful. Well, think about it. Are you super powerful now? Yeah, we got gifts of the Spirit. We got certain things that we could do right now. But superpower comes when you're raptured. Well, guess what the word rapture means? Ecstasis. Has anybody experienced the ecstasis of the Spirit before? I sure have. I like to experience that every day. Well, guess what? That's called being caught up in the Spirit. So let's just be raptured then. <laughs> okay. I have an entire thing. 
OK, so here's the thing. There is something we can do as the sons. We can redeem it. We can redeem the creation. We can emancipate it from the state that it's in. And how does this happen? It happens through us. So do you guys know the story? And you all probably know it. But I don't know if you've all heard it, though. St. Francis of Assisi. OK? So at the time when St. Francis, so this is, this is from his book, right? And you guys, if you watch that movie, you know, the, the, um, the New Mystics. But this is St. Francis. So this is, this is a guy. This is like 800 or 600 years ago. And this is a guy. He was just a, a monk. He was just a saint, one of the guys in the Catholic Church, and he's out there. But he has a reputation of being more mature. <laughs> this is a mature one, at least more mature in this area. And it says, at the time when St. Francis was living in the city of, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say all these right, but just bear with me. It looks like Gubbio. A large wolf appeared in the neighborhood, so terrible and so fierce that he not only devoured other animals, but made a prey of men also. And since he often approached the town, all the people were in great alarm and used to go about alarmed, as if going to battle. That doesn't sound very fun. Um, notwithstanding these precautions, if any of the inhabitants ever met him alone, he was sure to be devoured, as all defense was useless. And through fear of the wolf, they dared not go beyond the city walls. St. Francis, feeling great compassion for the people of Gubbio, resolved to go and meet the wolf, though all advised him not to do so. That seemed like a pretty smart idea to not do that, right? Making the sign of the Holy Cross and putting all his confidence in God, he went forth from the city, taking his brethren with him. But these fearing to go any further, St. Francis bent his steps alone toward the spot where the wolf was known to be while many people followed at a distance and witnessed the miracle. The wolf, seeing all this multitude, ran toward St. Francis with his jaws wide open. As he approached the saint, making the sign of the cross, cried out, Come hither, brother wolf, I command thee in the name of Christ, neither to harm me nor anybody else. Marvelous to tell, no sooner had St. Francis made the sign of the cross than the terrible wolf, closing his jaws, stopped running, and coming up to St. Francis, lay down at his feet as meekly as a lamb. And the saint thus addressed him, Brother Wolf, thou hast done much evil in this land, destroying and killing the creatures of God without his permission. Yea, not animals only hast thou destroyed, but thou hast even dared to devour men made after the image of God, for which thing thou art worthy of being hanged like a robber and a murderer. All men cry out against thee, the dogs pursue thee, and all inhabitants of this city are thy enemies. But I will make peace between them and thee, O brother wolf, if is so be thou no more offend them, and they shall forgive thee all thy past offenses, and neither men nor dogs shall pursue thee any more. Having listened to these words, the wolf bowed his head, and by the movements of his body, his tail and his eyes, made signs that he agreed to what St. Francis said. On this, St. Francis added, As thou art willing to make this peace, I promise thee that thou shalt be fed every day by the inhabitants of this land, so long as thou shalt live among them. Thou shalt no longer suffer hunger, as it is hunger which has made thee do such, so much evil. But if I obtain all this for thee, thou must promise on thy side never again to attack any animal or any human being. Dost thou make this promise? Then the wolf, bowing his head, made a sign that he consented. Said St. Francis again, Brother Wolf, wilt thou pledge thy faith that I may trust to this thy promise? And putting out his hand, he received the pledge of the wolf. For the latter lifted up his paw and placed it familiarly in the hand of St. Francis, giving him thereby the only pledge which was in his power. Then said St. Francis, addressing him again, Brother Wolf, I command thee in the name of Christ to follow me immediately, without hesitation or doubting, that we may go together to ratify this peace which we have concluded in the name of God. And the wolf, obeying him, walked by his side as meekly as a lamb, to the great astonishment of all the people. Now the news of this most wonderful miracle spreading quickly through the town, all the inhabitants, both men and women, small and great, young and old, flocked to the marketplace to see St. Francis and the wolf. Can you imagine seeing this? All the people being assembled, the saints got up to preach, saying, amongst other things, how for our sins God permits such calamities, and how much greater and more dangerous are the flames of hell, blah, 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 which can kill only the body if the jaws of so small an animal as a wolf can make a whole city tremble through fear. The sermon being ended, St. Francis added these words, Listen, my brethren, the wolf who is here before you has promised and pledged his faith that he consents to make peace with you all and no more to offend you in aught, and you must promise to give him each day his necessary food, to which, if you consent, I promise in his name that he will most faithfully observe the compact. Then all the people promised with one voice to feed 
the wolf to the end of his days. And St. Francis addressing the latter said, and thou, brother wolf, dost that promise to keep the compact and never again to offend either man or beast or any other creature. And so he agreed. And so I think this, this, this wolf lived another couple years, and this is exactly what he did. He was called brother wolf, and he just lived there in the town with them. He never killed another thing again, and he made this agreement. So, so why am I giving you this story? Because we're talking about the creation. The creation, we, we have this idea that the creation is evil and wicked and corrupt, but we can restore it. And so some of these guys took Jesus at his word. They took the word of God and said, well, I'm going to go talk to the wolf. So now, you can remember, one of them went, the rest of them couldn't. Their faith was not good enough to do that, but St. Francis was. But it shows you the potential of the new creation, that we can redeem the creation, and creation isn't waiting to be destroyed. It's waiting to be redeemed. It's waiting to be restored back, not destroyed. So whatever you know, sci-fi into the world movie that you've been watching, just remember that's total fantasy. And what we need to be seeing in our minds is this world looking like heaven. Because Jesus told us to pray on earth as it is in heaven. That means taking the earth in the place that it's at and not just giving up on it. Because that's what most Christians do. That's why Christians don't get into politics. That's why Christians go and hide their head in the sand. Because they think Jesus is just coming back and just let the whole thing go. And that is the exact opposite of what a mature son does. So there's a tremendous amount of immaturity in the church, which is that's one of the indications of it. A lot of the reasons is because nobody teaches the Bible anymore. <laughs> which is very important. You're not going to grow unless you hear the word of God because that's your food. So, uh, but, but still, we can change this, and churches are going to change. And, you know, I was reading the other day that the biggest trend in churches right now, you know what it is? The Bible. <laughs> it is. It's the biggest trend. People want to go to church to hear the Bible being taught. So, you know, so what will happen is, is all the churches that only make decisions based on what people want will start preaching the Bible again. And once they stop wanting to hear the Bible, they'll switch. And again. So anyway, so it's still irresponsible. But, st but still, it's very interesting because guess what? Sheep know when they're hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you haven't been feeding them, they know they're still hungry. So we need to be teaching the word of God. We need to be keeping this within us. And we need to understand where we are. So I'll end with this in verse 28. Thank you for bearing with me on this late message today. Verse 28 in Romans, back in Romans. Romans, oh no, I'm not in Romans, I'm sorry. I'm, in, I'm back in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 28. Yes, you can do it. All right, Hebrews 12, 28. So we're in this kingdom that's unshakable. It's an unshakable kingdom. So no matter what is shaking around us, the kingdom that we're in, the mountain of God, Mount Zion, and I've seen this. I've seen Mount Zion. I've been on it before. And we've all been on it. I have saw it, though. And we can be up on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the mountain above all of the mountains. No matter what mountain you've seen, the Mount Zion is the highest mountain, and it's over all the mountains. And one of the things that we're going to do, and you've probably heard this before, it's in the book of Isaiah, is one of the things that we do with the creation. On each of these mountains, we make the pathway up to Mount Zion. Every single mountain, every single thing that's here on the earth. So we have these things. We have business. Business is a mountain. It's not cursed. It's just a mountain. We're taking that business mountain and bringing it up to Mount Zion. We're taking the entertainment mountain. We're bringing up to Mount Zion. We're taking all of these other areas, these other mountains, these other things on the earth, and we're bringing them up to Mount Zion. Why are we doing that? Because that's part of the job. It's part of the things that the sons of God do. That's the things we do, okay? So we're in this kingdom, the new Jerusalem, Coming down from God, we're in that place. We're with the company of the messengers, the angels, and the witnesses. We're there with them. We are witnesses, too, by the way. <laughs> There's witnesses around us, but we're also witnesses. That's why we quote witness, because <laughs> we're witnesses. <laughs> Can I get a witness? All right, verse 28. Since therefore we have received a kingdom that is unshaken, let us grasp the grace. We're not in works anymore. <laughs> we're not under the law, we're in Mount Zion. Let's grasp the grace from which we may serve and please Elohim with reverence and fear. Is there a fear? Yes, <laughs> there is a fear, but not one that makes us far away. It's one that draws us in because it's our Father, right? So for our Elohim is a consuming fire. And this is what we're seeing. So all of this junk, right, we're consumed in his fire. God's word shakes us. It transforms us into the image of his glory. We're transformed into the image of his glory. We are sons of God 
being continually changed from one level of glory to another level of glory. That's how we change. And that talks about that in Corinthians. One level to the next level to the next level to the next level. The kingdoms of the earth will shake and they will fall. All of them will. But the eternal kingdom of God is unshakable and this is the kingdom that we have received. This is the kingdom that we are in. So change your thinking. Where are you? You're in Mount Zion. You're not at this scary place, scary Mount Sinai, far away God who's about to zap you. We're in Mount Zion. Amen? All right, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word today. And we just thank you that you are revealing to us more and more in you. We just thank you that we would just meditate on the things that you've shown us, continue in the revelation you've given us. And we thank you that all things are coming in through you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.